Let's join in our call to worship. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Our first hymn is number 474, if you want to read in the Dark Blue Hymn Book, The Love of God Comes Close. Let's stand and sing. So, Lord, who is always with us, be with us in power now and help us to see you. Lord, who holds us close and walks with us, draw near and let us know it, because we are here to worship you, God. We are here because you are good and loving. We're here because you have called us, called us into your love called us to be your sons and daughters with Jesus Christ, called us to be uh, your servants, your missionaries, your people. So Lord, help us to be who we are in you as we worship together now and each day. And Lord, we ask these things that you've already provided because we are people who are constantly in need as we need air each minute, as we need water and food each day, we need your grace to be fresh and new for us now. You have called us to be your people, and yet we, we so often wander away from you. 
you've told us who we really are, and yet we so often resist uh, the, the call of your grace. We have sinned, Lord, and we are sorry. Forgive us and set us free. We confess to you now the, the individual things that are bothering us, that are holding us back. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of your love come down to earth, of your Holy Spirit still with us now. Please bless us and help us to be a blessing in Jesus' name. And now together we share the prayer that he taught to us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ lived for you, died for you, and rose for you. And Jesus Christ has left his Holy Spirit to live within you. You are forgiven. You are free. You are loved. Receive this gift and know God's peace. Amen. What I just said is true, and we get to sh not just live that, but share it. So I invite you to turn to your neighbor and share the words, the peace of Christ be with you. Our next hymn is number 471, We Are One in the Spirit. Let's stand and sing to Baptism is not of our doing or our deserving. It is a gift from God. In the sacrament of baptism, the church recognizes God's covenant of grace. We receive God's gift with reverent joy and respond in faith and obedience. Remember the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost. 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, every one whom the Lord our God calls. Hear the words of the risen Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Obeying the command of Jesus Christ and believing in his promises the church baptizes those whom the Lord our God calls. God acts for us in baptism, as God has acted for our salvation from the beginning of time. By the waters of baptism and the power of the Holy Spirit, God claims us and calls each one of us by name. God unites us to Christ in his death and resurrection and grafts us into the body of Christ as members of the church. God washes us clean by forgiving our sin, commissions us to be a royal priesthood with Christ in his ministry to the world, empowers us to live in newness of life as people of the world, and invites us to be renewed at the Lord's table until we feast with him in glory. By grace you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Who comes to receive the gift of baptism? On behalf of the session, I present Sheena Lockie to receive the sacrament of Do you desire to be baptized? Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, who has been faithful to us in all generations, do you turn away from sin, renounce evil and all powers in the world that rebel against God, or oppose God's rule of justice and love? Do you renounce the ways of sin, which separate you from the love of God? Do you turn to Jesus Christ, accepting him as Lord and Savior, trusting his grace and love? And do you desire, in dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit, to mature as a Christian in the church, to seek the guidance of Christ as you listen for his word, to celebrate his death and life at the table he provides, and to engage in his mission to the world? Please stand. <clears throat> Do you, on behalf of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Sheena by word and deed, with love and in prayer, encouraging her to follow the way of Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? Amen. Let us profess our faith in the words that are common to the Holy Catholic Church. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, 
and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O gracious God, for the gifts of water and of your Spirit. In the beginning, when your Spirit moved over the waters, you gave order and life to your planet Earth. By the waters of the flood, you cleansed the earth and established with Noah and his family a new beginning for all people. In the time of Moses, you led your people out of slavery through the waters of the sea, making covenant with them in a new land. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, formed in the water of a woman's womb. In the water of the Jordan, Jesus was baptized and anointed by your Holy Spirit. Gracious God, by the gift of water and your Spirit, you sustain all life. Almighty God, by the power of your Holy Spirit and by the sign of this water, you cleanse from sin through the death of Jesus Christ those who receive this sacrament. You raise them to new life through his resurrection, and you graft them into his body, the Church. Pour out your Spirit upon this your child, that she may have power to do your will and continue forever as a servant of Christ to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Sheena, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You are a child of God. Join us in the joy of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise you for calling us to be your people, for gathering us to be the church, the body of Christ. We thank you for leading our sister to this time and place in affirmation of your gifts to her in baptism. Together, may we live in your spirit, grow in faith, hope, and love, and be faithful disciples of Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called his children, for that is what we are. Sheena. You are now received by Christ's appointment into the Holy Catholic Church. Through baptism, God has made you a member of the household of God, to share with Christ in the priesthood of all believers. Remember your baptism and give thanks. Be one with us in the Church. I'd ask you now to please stand and we'll sing a blessing over Sheep. chapters 18 and 19. We'll start at verse 24 
Um, at this point in the book of Acts, we're following a man named Paul as he goes and uh, spreads the good news of Jesus throughout the, uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, and in order that this is God's word to us here and now, let's ask for help. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you have already poured yourself out in power on us today. We ask that once more you will speak, you will move, and that these words may be words of hope and love, encouragement and instruction for us here and now. In Jesus' name, amen. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia, and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus had encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Achaia, asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be of great benefit to those who, by God's grace, had believed. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Then Paul went to the synagogue, and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message, and publicly, publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he had held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years, so that the people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Gentiles, Heard the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blue Jays, Tigers, or don't care. <laughs> or, or I guess other. So Blue Jays, Tigers. Wow, what are you few? Other or don't care? Yeah. Um, sports teams are a way we divide ourselves up into tribes that's fun and usually positive. Not always, I mean, I've seen footage of riots, <laughs> but, uh, but usually they're a fun way of splitting up into teams, right? And we do things like, oh, we're having a good season this year, right? Have you ever said that? We're having a good season or we're having a bad season about a sports team? And have any of you ever played for a major league sports team? <laughs> but we, we naturally like joining uh, teams, and part of the fun is a rivalry. Um, I own a Toronto Blue Jays shirt specifically because I wanted to bug your son. <laughs> He's a big Tigers fan, and we went to a game together. It's a fun kind of rivalry. But I could cause some serious division if I asked some other questions from the pulpit, right? 
Like, everyone put up your hand if you voted for. <laughs> or what do you think about this complicated issue? I'm actually um, actively grateful to be part of a church where people think different ways about major issues. I actually think that is extremely healthy. I'm grateful that when there's an election, um, there's a couple of people I know who campaign for different parties and are sitting in church together. And I'm grateful for that because that kind of thing is happening less in our world today. We like forming into teams. We like having rivalry with other teams. And sports is a kind of mostly healthy, usually healthy way of, of having those kind of rivalries. But boy, do they get toxic fast. And uh, historically, no, historically and presently, the church does not always do a great job at handling differences and disagreements well. And we tend to go one of two ways with important disagreements. Um, one of them is to split and hold the other side as dangerous uh, and in the context of the church, even to the level of not really Christians. If we disagree about that, then you obviously don't actually believe in Jesus properly. Have you heard of divisions like that around? The other way we can go is, oh look, everyone's different and it doesn't matter what you believe. So either you're in or you're out and we're gonna have a split or eh, everyone's got their own opinions. And I don't think either of those actually serve the church or the world or Jesus very well. We are here to learn the truth from one another and to seek it together with love and humility. And these couple of stories in Acts that we read, um, how many of you when we read that were like, oh yeah, this is a famous story in the Bible? How many of you were like, I don't think I've ever remember hearing this story before? Right? This is not a big, you know, drama-filled story in the book of, of Acts. But if we look at it, there's a beautiful way in which uh, differences are taught and explained and brought together. And it's two stories about different views of what's happening in a baptism. Sometimes we imagine the early church as a group of people that agreed about everything and they had it all correct and we have messed up in the last 2,000 years. Except for us, of course, all the other churches have messed up. Um, but Jesus came, he died, he rose, and people scattered, sometimes intentionally to go share the good news. And a lot of times people scattered because they would get killed otherwise um, and spread the good news wherever they went. And the book of Acts in its second half follows, mostly follows, one missionary named Paul as he travels around. But it wants us to remember there's more. And we meet here a man whose name has not yet come up in the Bible before this point, named Apollos. He's a Jew from Egypt, um, and he's from the city of Alexandria, which uh, had the most famous library in the world. It was the center of education for, for the world at that time. And we're told Apollos is a well-read, well-reasoned guy. And he's heard the news of Jesus Christ. You don't hear how. Whether he was doing a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was there um, at Passover when Jesus died and rose, or whether he's heard about it from someone else, doesn't actually matter to Luke as he's writing the book of Acts. Apollos 
knows the truth and who wants to share it and he speaks accurately. And there's a tricky phrase in Greek um, with every time I say in Greek, I'm worried everyone goes, oh, but hopefully you don't. Um, there's a tricky phrase here, which here is translated, um, I can't find it. Uh, oh, he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit. And I read a whole bunch of commentaries this week, because I usually do when preparing a sermon. It's not clear whether it's talking about Apollos' spirit or the Holy Spirit. I think, from what I read, the better translation is, he was powerful in the spirit, capital S. But capital letters didn't exist back then. So we're told he teaches well, he teaches accurately, and either he's got powerful spirit in him, or more likely, he's powerful in the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't have everything right. That's Luke as a narrator telling us about Apollos. He's a good teacher, he's well-reasoned, um, he's powerful in the Holy Spirit, and, and he, he had a few things wrong. Specifically, uh, we're told he only knew about John's baptism. We call John John the Baptist because he had a ministry for several years before Jesus' ministry began of baptizing people for the forgiveness of their sins. He dunked them in the river so that they could be washed clean and live a life toward God. And he, his mission was to get people ready for the Messiah. And when Jesus came to him, his line was, I don't need to baptize you, you need to baptize me. And Jesus said, no, this is what God wants us to do. And John, uh, it's, the, it's the first story after the Christmas story uh, in the Gospels. John dunks Jesus, baptizes him, and when Jesus comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus. And that's when Jesus starts his ministry as God's Messiah. So John's an extremely important figure for Christians, and baptism existed before Christians were doing it. Right? There's no such thing as a Christian until after the resurrection and after Pentecost. Apollos has been going around teaching about Jesus, but he doesn't know that there's people in the church that are baptizing people with water and that the Holy Spirit is coming on them. And a couple named Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife, um, we hear about them in some of the letters. They're really excited to hear what Apollos has to say, and they bring him aside and explain, here's what baptism is, and you should know this. <coughs> And can I be cynical and say that we have a miracle here? I know that sounds like a weird phrase. Because here's this powerful preacher. Um, we're told he's, he's better at public speaking than Paul, it seems like. He's a smart guy. He's a missionary. And a couple who aren't missionaries pull him aside and correct his doctrine. And he doesn't freak out. Someone tells him he's got something wrong, and he doesn't freak out. Now, do you think I'm being too cynical to call that a miracle? Because we acknowledge that doesn't happen a lot, where people are corrected, and they're like, oh, great, now I know better. But isn't that neat? Like, he's been teaching the truth about Jesus with power, and when he finds out he's been missing something important, he goes, thank you, and starts teaching that too. Now that is the way it's supposed to be. And maybe it's about how discouraged I am sometimes when I hear people arguing 
in this day and age that I find that miraculous. This isn't a story about Apollos being converted to Christ. In this story, it doesn't seem like he's baptized again. It's not needed. He just learns and grows and takes his already powerful ministry, his already powerful call from God, and makes it better after he's been corrected. Today, in worship, a little earlier, we marked a beginning. But, uh, Sheena, was this the first time God's ever done something with you? No. It's a beginning. It's not the only beginning with God. God's been working in her life, in all of our lives, before we know it. Today we've marked a beginning in the Lord. A baptism matters. The Holy Spirit works for us, on us, through us in baptism. And we're not done. God has brought one person to their baptism today. And my instruction for her, keep on growing. And my instruction for y'all, I think you can guess, keep on growing. The Lord always has something new for us and a new beginning. And the humility to know that sometimes we can get things wrong, Sometimes we can mess up and, and need correction and not freak out and accept it with joy is part of that growth. The second story cuts back to the main character of Paul. And uh, Paul gets to the city of Ephesus and finds people who um, are called mm -hmm. disciples but it's not actually clear in the text whether they're disciples of Jesus or disciples of John. They seem to have heard about Jesus, but understand him as a prophet like John, and they don't know about the Holy Spirit. Now, in this case, it seems like Paul's understanding is they are not followers of Jesus yet, but he doesn't say to them, Everything you believed is wrong. He says, great, you've been trying to follow God, you've been following God, and now God has given us this gift, and here's a way to do it better. Here's a way to bring that to completeness. You've, you've been baptized in the way that John did, you've asked forgiveness for your sins, now receive the gift of God's Savior, who John was pointing to. And they look at him and go, great, let's do this. I mean, that's not exactly what it says, but I want to imagine them going, dude! But that says more about me than about the Bible, probably. <laughs> but they receive this new gift with joy. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, it does the same miracles of power, of speaking in tongues, of prophesying, of declaring God's goodness, that the Spirit did at Pentecost the first time. The lines around who's in and who's out, who counts and who doesn't, who's even a follower of Jesus and who's not quite there yet, they're not really clear in these stories. But neither are they stories about well, whatever you believe is fine. The gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism is presented in these stories. Can I just say is in truth? The gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism is the greatest gift anyone can receive. And it's, it is a gift for everyone. 
But rather than angry recriminations about differences, we find in this story people building on the truth that people already know and welcoming people in with grace and people receiving correction with joy. It's a story about the ways that people keep on growing. And I think it really matters to us in the church today. I, uh, I heard a uh, presenter at a continuing education event talking about church unity these days. And he said that a, a big difference in North America now from the olden days um, is if you believe you live in a Christian country, then which kind of church is the best kind of church is a really important question to everybody. Because whether the Baptists or the Presbyterians or the Catholics or the Pentecostals or the Lutherans or the how many more names do you want me to say, because there's so many different kinds of Christian, which one of those is right matters a lot if you think you live in a Christian society. Because which church is the best church determines who's in charge. And we love to argue about who's in charge. But, the speaker said, if you believe you live in a mission field, then the differences between churches suddenly become, hey, who are you good at reaching? Who are we good at reaching? Apollos is mentioned in one other place in the Bible. When Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, in Greece, um, he writes to them and says, you know, people from Chloe's house have told me that you guys are fighting over whether me or Apollo is, Apollos is a better preacher. Half the church in Corinth is going, oh yeah, I'm a Paul fan. Some of them are saying, I'm an Apollos fan. Um, and actually, there's a small minority who are going, yeah, we like that Peter guy better. And then there's a fourth group in the church in Corinth saying, we don't care about any of this, we follow Jesus. And Paul, in the letter to the Corinthians, writes, and he's not even happy with the fourth group, <laughs> because they're all trying to create a team within the church. I'm the better kind of Christian, because I follow Paul. He was a better teacher. I've, I'm a better kind of Christian because I follow Apollos. He was a better speaker. Peter is the, the OG. He's the original guy. Well, I'm, we're part of the Jesus crew. No, says Paul. And he, writes, uh, he writes this in chapter 3. After all, who's Apollos? Who's Paul? We're only God's servants through whom you receive the good news. Each of us did the, word, the, the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts. Apollos watered it. It was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose. And both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Isn't that a beautiful way of dealing with this disagreement? Over these arguments about who's better? We're working together, people, says Paul. He doesn't want a fan club. If our church, if our congregation was full of people with all the same gifts, how quickly do you think we'd fall apart? Right? If everyone in the church was exactly like you, how long do you think the church would last? If everyone in the church was exactly like me, how long do you think the church would last? We can maybe keep it going for a few weeks. Our differences are not a flaw in the God's design. They're part of the system. 
We all have things to teach one another, to grow through one another, and we all have different gifts to give. Paul uses this image of one person planting a seed and another watering it. There's stuff that I can't do for the Lord that you can. There's stuff that you can't do for the Lord that the person sitting across the aisle from you can. Our differences don't have to be division because all of us together are seeking the truth. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on all of us with power to love and serve the Lord together. So keep on growing. Amen. We now have a chance to uh, present our offerings to God. Let's uh, stand and sing a blessing. thank you most for the gift of yourself. We pray that what we offer now, that who we are together, may bring that blessing of you to this community around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Our next hymn is number 585, Christ, You Call Us All to Service. Let's sing together.
We pray for new beginnings for our city. We pray for new beginnings for those in, um, in poverty and despair. We pray for new beginnings for those with uh, tremendous wealth who let fear rule them. We pray new beginnings for our congregation, our church, each week. God of beginnings, bless us at the start. Lord, you are the Omega, the God of the end, the purpose of all things, that the one to whom all things go. Thank you, Lord, that we are safe for eternity with you. We pray for peace for those who are sick and dying. We pray uh, for those who have experienced loss, that you'll hold them close. Thank you, God, that we can face any earthly ending with hope, that your love is the end, the aim of all things, and that, that the gift you've given us, the, the spirit you've given us in Jesus Christ, is a gift that is eternal. And God of beginnings, God of ends, thank you that you are here with us in the messy middle. We thank you for your grace at work here and now, for your love in this imperfect and broken world. And we pray that you will help each one of us to grow, to learn, to serve in ways that we are good at and are comfortable with, and to serve you in ways that terrify us. And thank you, Lord God of right now, that you are with us, that you will be with us when we go. Send us in power to spread your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Our last uh, hymn for today is uh, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Let's stand and sing once more.
Go in peace and go in power. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.